Lord uh, restores. And so, Pastor Steve, would you come and would you guys welcome Pastor Steve with me? Thank you, brother. Thank you. Nay, I don't think we checked it. There we go. That was fun. That was fun. I, uh, I used to be on the worship team. I played the triangle. But, but I gave it up because it was just one ting after another. I tell bad jokes at our church all the time. It's, if I don't, they get upset with me. <laughs> Last week, I just, I just told him this. Nothing tops a plain pizza. <laughs> That's really funny. Okay, here we go. So, uh, last night, we... Uh, we talked about Hurricane Irma and how it impacted us in the Keys and what we went through. And what I wanted to do with that in mind is I want to talk um, a little bit about a type of thinking that most of us have uh, and that until we come to grips with it, we're not going to have the impact on the world that God wants us to have. And I call this type of thinking uh, cause and effect thinking. And um, it's a very negative way of looking at things. And it impacts the way we relate to God. It impacts the way we relate to the world around us. And so um, what I wanted to do is, is uh, talk about that for a few moments. I want to look at two uh, passages of Scripture. We're going to actually look at the book of Job. And then we're going to hop over into John chapter 9. So it'll be an interesting time, uh, I believe, to see what uh, is going on. And I want to start in, in Job. Uh, there's a fascinating passage, Job 42, verses 1 through 3. Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No plan of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this that obscures my counsel without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. Blessed be the word of the Lord. Um, the book of Job is an amazing book. And so I want to hop in. I've, I've got some points uh, and then I'm going to try and stick to. The first point I want to talk about is, is uh, what I call our God box our God box. And what happens is that culturally, we don't really like to live in tension. Um, we uh, culturally sort of really want bottom line thinking. We, we want our facts, and, and that's really important to us as a culture. And the problem that we have that comes along with that is we tend to do that in our relationship with God. And what we do when we think that way is we sort of bring God down to our level so we can manage him. And we, we sort of want to have God all figured out so that we can put him in a box of our own making. We, we, uh, and we may not realize it, but what we are looking to have is this sort of nice, tidy, manageable deity. That's, that's kind of what happens to us. Um, but, but when we have that, what we have is a little G God in our own image, and we're not relating to the God of the universe the way he wants to. And the book of Job is, is really all about that. It's an amazing book. Uh, in the scripture, it's known as wisdom literature. Uh, and, and we're to go for wisdom. And really, what the entire book about is understanding that God is bigger than us. That's at the heart of the entire book. A lot of people try and get in there and they try and figure all sorts of other things out. Um, and they're doing that be, because they're trying to get God back in a box. Because when you read the book of Job, it really will explode any God box that you think you might have. It just will, it, it will not allow you to keep God in a box without trying to distort the facts. So um, what happens in the book of Job, I'm just going to go through it quickly. Uh, don't worry, we're not going to read all 42 chapters. Um, the book starts out with a guy named Job. And the Bible says this about Job, that he's upright and blameless. So Job is a righteous man. He, he's doing the right things. He loves his family. He's loving God. He's doing the things that he should be doing. 
And then all of a sudden, we're sort of caught up into the heavenlies. And we're, we're not really explaining what's going on. People are trying to figure all that out. But it's just a picture of what's happening. And God uh, says, hey, have you checked out Job? Job is, basically God says Job is two thumbs up. Job is awesome. Has everybody checked out Job? That's God speaking about Job. Well, the enemy is in the picture somehow, and he goes, well, yeah, of course. Uh, you know, he's only good, though, because you bless him. Take away all the stuff that he has and all the stuff that you're doing in his life, and watch what happens. He won't love you. And so God says, all right. And, and uh, he allows it. Now, that action in and of itself should get your attention because what I would suggest to you that that doesn't fit into our God box. At, at the moment that happens, we're, we're like, well, wait, wait a minute. He's a good dude. He's doing what he's supposed to do. There's no problems going on. And, and you sort of, it looks like you set him up, God. And, and uh, that, that, how, how is that even possible for that to happen? And uh, in the story, Job starts to lose everything. He loses it all. And he gets afflicted with boils, and he's sick, and everything's bad. And, and when you read the story, you're like, how, oh, wait a minute, that doesn't fit into anything that I've tried to sort of put, you know, God in this box of how things are supposed to work. And it just blowing it apart. And then in the story, Job has three friends who show up, and uh, they're there to comfort him, but they've all got their own God box going on, and so for a lot of chapters in the book of Job, they're talking to Job, and Job's talking back to them, but all three friends in their own way, pretty much the same thing, and they, this is what they say, Job, you must have done something really wrong, or this wouldn't be happening to you. Every one of them says the same thing. It's got to be something that you've done or this couldn't be happening. And see, if we're not careful, what happens is, without realizing it, we're sort of doing that same thing in our lives, in situations that are going on. And we're, we're sort of blinded by uh, our own limitations of who God is and what God does because we put him in a box. box rather than just letting God be God, and, and, you know, really being able to know that we can trust in him and that he works all things out. But there's a mystery to it. See, we get settled in what I call cause and effect thinking. If I do this, then God does that. And we do that even if you're not realizing it, you're doing it all the time. And there's a majesty and a sovereignty of God that's so much greater than we can imagine. And the reality is, there's no way that we can actually manage or control the God of the universe. It just can't happen. He's God. And as the story continues, in Job 38, all of a sudden God shows up in a whirlwind. Uh, verses 1 through 3. And I was, I, whirlwinds catch my attention lately. Um, <laughs> Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now prepare yourself like a man. I always want to read it this way. Now prepare yourself like a man. Because that's what I think God would be saying there. I don't know. <laughs> and I will question you and you will answer me. Wow. So he speaks out of the whirlwind. I love that. You know, in Exodus, as you go back there, um, he, he shows up in a burning bush and he speaks in 1 Kings uh, 19, 11 and 12. It, it, the Lord says, uh, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. And then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord wasn't in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord wasn't in the fire. And after the fire came uh, a gentle a whisper, and, and God spoke in the gentle whisper, and, and I think those things are in there because God doesn't want us to be able to put him in a box. He comes and he speaks in different ways, uh, and so that we're always having to press in and listen and pay attention. God sometimes speak in t-shirts. Sometimes God will speak to you out of a jar of olives. Go figure. 
but he speaks. But if we've got him in this box that we think we're managing, we're going to miss God all the time because he doesn't do things the way that we think he's going to. In this case, he, he spoke out of a whirlwind and he begins to tell Job, he said, you know, I've listened to you guys talk. And he says, where were you when I laid the foundations? Where were you when I laid all the pillars? Where were you when I did all these things? And he goes on and on in Job 39 and 40 and 41. And finally, in the last chapter of Job, which is what the whole book is leading to us, he, he, it says, um, then Job answered the Lord. After the Lord had given him, chapter, 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 where were you, where were you, where were you, can you understand, how can you know? And Job says, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. What Job finally comes to, he said, I've come to realize that I can never understand the way that you run the universe. So I have to trust that you're a good God and that you're a righteous God and that you're a just God and you're a holy God and a loving God. And, I, and I've come to realize there's no way I can know who you are completely. See, he's God. He, he's, he's larger than anything we could ever imagine. He doesn't fit into our own little perspective of how we think things ought to be. And we have to avoid the tendency we have to want to define God that fits into a tidy, manageable system, manageable system because what happens when we do that is we reduce the mystery of our faith to a certainty of understanding and we don't know how to trust God anymore. And we, and we don't know how to have faith. See, if, if we have a certainty of our understanding, faith goes out the window. There's, there's no more faith. There's no more trust. There's, there's no more awe. There's no more wonder. See, we've been talking here a lot about worship. Uh, I was here this morning. And see, there's a majesty to God. There's a, there's a wonder to God. Uh, there's, there's an awe that, that, that just, it, you know, stirs our souls to worship. But if he reduce him, if we try and reduce him into something we can manage, there's none of that. There's, there's I've just got God in my box, and, and, and then he's not really God at all. He's the little G God of my own making. And we no longer experience him for who he truly is, the God of miracles, the, the God of might, the God of power, the God of love, the God of adventure, the God who is worthy of our worship, the God who owns everything, the Lord. And so we have to, we have to make sure we don't define God by circumstances. But that's our tendency. See, and, and that's where we get into trouble. We, we think if we're doing what we're supposed to do, then God is going to make everything good and everything should be good. When something's not good and we, we can't figure it out, we often think that we're being punished or that he's not hearing us or we, we just get into all this mess. But, but this is a messy world sometimes. After the hurricane hit down in, uh, in the Keys, uh, a week or two after we got a phone call, the phones were working uh, by then. Or I think we must have. I think we got a cell phone working pretty quickly, and uh, one of our pastors answered the phone. And she's our children's pastor and administrator, and she loves God, and she's been with me a long time. And and this person called, and she said, "Listen, I I have a question." And Pastor Nordina said, "Yeah, well, what's the question?" She said, "Well, I want to know if you know if anybody that was really a believer, if they really had any damage to their homes or lost anything." And Pastor Georgina went, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's just, I just don't think that people that really love God have anything to worry about and nothing could have happened to them. Well, Pastor, it was funny that Pastor Georgina got the call because their house really got wrecked. <laughs> and she was like, what? She, it didn't even, she couldn't even comprehend. But for some people, that's the way that they think. That if you're, if every, if you're doing all the stuff that you're supposed to do, then, then you, you should be immune from the stuff that's going on in the world around us. And they reduce God to a system that they can manage. And, and that's not how God operates. So you, you can't understand God or know God or define God by circumstances. God's character, this is the second point there, is not based on circumstances, and we have to know that. See, um, if, if we could deduce it from circumstances, we'd miss out on God altogether. God's character is made known to us through the Scripture. And, and so we can't let 
circumstance dictate the way that we interpret God or the way that we see God. The only way we can begin to understand who he is at some measure is by what he's revealed to us and told us in the scripture. And the scripture, the Bible, the word of God is God breathed. Listen to what Paul says to Timothy, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God, sorry, I slipped up a little bit. I'm coming back, is equipped for every good work, thoroughly equipped for every good work. God breathed, that word in, in the Greek is uh, theonoustos. Uh, theos uh, is the word for God. Noustos is wind or spirit. So it's God breathed, breath. It's his breath. Scripture is God's breath. I, I want you to think of the word that way. It's God's breath. So when we're in a circumstance that's not good or that we don't understand or that's beyond us, what is it that we have to cling to? We have we have. We have to cling to what God has said about himself, which means that no matter what you're going through, no matter whatever the circumstance might be, whether it's the mountaintop or the valley, God is a God of love. Whether you're on a mountaintop or in a valley, God is a God of righteousness. Whether it's a mountaintop or a valley, God is a God of grace. Uh, he's a God of forgiveness. He's a God of mercy. He's, he's just and he's holy and he's righteous. And he's running the universe according to who he is. And whether we understand it or not, by faith we trust who God is by what he said about himself and we embrace him then in the mystery of our faith. And so what does, God, what does Job say after all of that? Chapter 42, verse 3. He says, you asked, who is this that obscures my counsel without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. He said, I, I spoke stuff I didn't know. Uh, I looked at my circumstances and I tried to make sense out of it all, but I've said things too wonderful for me, things I don't know. I cannot develop my understanding of God based on my circumstances. It has to come down to Scripture. Uh, at our church, one of the things that I do every week is I constantly encourage people to read the Bible. The um, Sometimes we don't embrace it and read it the way that we should. We get busy. And I always tell people that the enemy, we have a very crafty enemy, you know that? Just like, like he was here. There's two things, that, of, of all the things, but there's two things he really likes to steal from you. One of them is your time reading the Bible, and one is your time in prayer. If he can get you too busy to do those things, you might be busy doing a whole lot of really good stuff, but if he gets you so busy and preoccupied that you get out of the Word and you get out of prayer, you really become ineffective on this journey. And so we have to embrace our time in the Word. We have to make it a priority in our lives. We have to embrace a time of prayer, of just listening to the Lord, because that's how we know about him is in those times, not on the things that are going on around us, but based on who he is. When the storm came, I got to tell you, you know, I, I said last night, we, we had that word that my wife got, and I knew what the word meant. Pretty sure this thing is coming, but don't worry, I've got you. And, and, and I knew that. I didn't know what that meant. Uh, it, it could have been that everything could have been gone when we got back. It, it could have meant that, that uh, everything would have changed. You know, it could have meant that, that we, we might even have to move. Who knows what it meant? But I knew that he had me in it. It didn't mean that it was going to go the way I wanted. I just knew that he had me. And, and I had that confidence throughout that God's got us in this because of who he says he is and what he says about himself. And so let me encourage you, if you're not doing it, read your Bibles. Take time every day. Read some scripture. Five minutes. Five minutes. But, but be aware that the enemy will try and steal that time from you. He's really crafty. Because you'll say, okay, that sounds good. I'm going to do that. Okay, I'm going to read it. And, and all of a sudden, you go to sit down and read, your phone will ring or somebody will need you, or something will happen. And, and, and you, oh, well, I guess, and then you don't get back to it. Same thing, you'll sit down to pray, and all of a sudden, something will happen, and, and you'll get distracted, or your mind will wander. Nobody ever has their mind wander when they're praying, do they? <laughs> and if you're not careful, you know what you think about? Everything you got to do. When I sit down in the morning to pray, the first thing I do before I pray is I make a list of everything that's on my mind that I have to do so that I can stop thinking about it. 
it's really helped me stay focused and connected because I know it's up there on the list. Okay, now I don't have to worry about it. I'm not going to forget about it. I wrote it. Now let me get focused. And I combine those times. But don't let the enemy steal that from you. That's, that's so vital in, in, our, in our life, in our worship of God, is that we know his word. And the only way we know it is by spending time in it and, and embracing it. Um, both Pastor David and, and Dr. Clem uh, this morning, both were in Psalm 119 which is one of my favorite psalms. Uh, it's a very long psalm. It's the longest psalm. It's 176 verses. But I don't know if you know this, 176 verses, all but two of those verses are uh, directly about the Word of God. They're mentioned in, ver you look and you just read it, it's either about his, his, uh, his statutes or his precepts or the word or uh, something, every single verse, that's how important they accept two. There's two in there. I, I would challenge you to read Psalm 119 and find those two verses. I could tell you what they are, but I don't want to do that. Two verses that don't directly reference the, the word of the Lord because it's that important and, and we need to understand it. And so I want to encourage you to read the word. So, so that kind of sets up the, the story I want to talk about. I want to, I want to sort of move into this encounter that Jesus has with a man born blind. Now, last night I talked about, you know, green olive trees and where to be a light to the world. And remember I said in, in Matthew 5, uh, 16, Jesus said, in the same way let your light shine before men so they can see your good deeds. And then Paul said in Philippians 2, 4, 14, 16, that we're to, to shine like stars in the universe, holding out the word of life, and that that word is the gospel the good news and we talked about how important it was for people to hear the good news and that they hear that good news from us as we live this life out and and they they open themselves to hear that Christ died for their sins was buried and rose again on the third day and they receive that and respond to it and they come into the kingdom and so um, we're tasked to be a people of mission so as we're believers we're, we're the, sort of the reason we don't get zapped up into heaven right away because we're citizens of heaven is that we have uh, a mission and we're called to the mission and the ministry of reconciliation and, and we're to do that by living this life out and, and you know sharing this amazing good news with people that we meet uh, we have a very real enemy as I said and he has blinded people to the truth uh, I didn't put this one in the notes but in 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, it says the, the little g God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they're blinded, uh, they're in the darkness, and it's the light of the gospel that brings them out of darkness into light. But I want to talk about this story, uh, about an encounter that Jesus has with this man born blind. And in some way, spiritually, we're all born blind. So hold that sort of in context. John chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. As he went along, he saw a, a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. And having said this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva. Caught my finger on there again. But it's okay. And put it on the man's eyes. I knew that part. <laughs> Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. Now, this is an amazing encounter in lots of ways. Uh, and there's so many things going on there. I always like that, that, uh, you know, Jesus makes a little mud pie. You, you like that? The little mud, puts it on the guy's eyes. I always tell folks, listen, uh, if you're going to uh, spit on somebody's eyes, they better get healed. And uh, <laughs> you better be really sure that that's the deal. So, uh, so he, he, he does that. And the man came home seeing. Now, 
I talked, and this is the third point, about cause and effect thinking. And here's, you, you need to catch this in the story. The first two verses, as he went along of John 9, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, do you, do you get that thinking there? That, that's cause and effect thinking, something that we all struggle with. Here's a situation that doesn't seem right to us, and uh, at, at the time, it didn't seem right to them. The established religious community, they believe this, that those who do right will be rewarded, and those who do wrong will be punished. And, and so it followed by their reasoning that any personal disasters were evidence of sin, and prosperity was a sign of God's approval. So this was the thinking, so that when they see this situation, they, they're looking for somebody to blame. There has to be someone to be at blame in this situation. Was it his sin, or was it his parents' sin that are causing the problem? There has to be somewhere to put the blame. That's part of cause and effect thinking. So I said, when, when things don't go our way, if we have that thinking, we'll blame God, we'll blame others, we'll blame ourselves, but we, we'll miss the bigger picture of what's really going on. And so in order... To let the light of the world shine through us, and we talked about last night, we have to deal with some of the big questions in life. Like, why do bad things happen? Why does a God who claims to be good allow so much evil in the world? Why doesn't he do something? And so we have this tendency where we, we tend to be very performance-oriented in the way we do, and we have that thinking. If I do good things, good things should happen. If I'm basically a good person, then I shouldn't have to deal with tragedies, hardship, pain, or suffering. And, and th this is part of that God-in-a-box cause-and-effect thinking. And, and why is it so messed up? The reality is uh, that we live in a fallen world on a broken planet. Things here are not perfect. God created them perfect, but sin entered the world and messed it all up. And that is not God's fault, it's ours. See, God wants people to be able to choose to worship Him and to love Him, and so He gives us the ability to make choices. And with that ability to make choices, we have all chosen to sin, just like Adam and Eve, who had utopia and still wanted more. So we have to understand that's in the dynamic. But we, we want to live these pain-free, white picket fence lives now, and because of our performance orientation, we think that by being good, that, that what should happen then is that we should experience this sort of pain-free, no problem living. But see, that living is, is a promise but it's not a now promise, it's a future promise. Revelation 21.4 says, He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. That's when we're glorified and we're with Jesus. That, that's when everything is new. So, so we, we want that stuff, and, and we think we ought to be in it now, but we can't have it all now. And so our motivation for living here uh, can't be all about immediate rewards and pain-free living. When, when it is, we spend our time angry at God, and things aren't going the way we want, and you know that uh, we, we say, not my will but yours be done? It's a lot easier to say than it is to live out on this, on this journey. So our motivation for living has to be a love response to what God has already done at the cross. And there he's given us a future and a hope. See, God in, in Christ has already given us his very best. He can't give us anything better than what he's already given us. We've already received the absolute best thing that we could ever have. We've been reconciled to God through Christ. We have eternal life. Um, this side of heaven, we have the best life that's available in the universe, but there's still the, the fallout of sin affecting the things around us. And so he's given us the best. And so um, our our reason, our motivation for living and doing what we should do isn't so we can make this life all work all the time because it just won't. It's, it's a response to this love that he's already given us that we're going to love him uh, back. We're going to worship him in our lives. And when that happens, we can begin to see how God can take the hardest, most difficult situations in our lives and somehow use them to help others. And that's significant. That your, your life is more than your own. See, we, we, we sort of put ourselves 
this cause and effect thinking and everything in the center of the universe and that the universe is revolving around us. That's normal. It's our nature. It's part of the bad fallen nature stuff, but that's nature. How does this impact me? What does that mean to me? But see, in Christ, and the way you were created was that, that Jesus would be the center of the universe. It's, this is, I like to say that this is his story. He's the noun of the story, not us. We're the adjectives. We live describing who he is. And the, and the amazing thing is, is that when we understand that he's the noun of the story and we're not, and we put him in that place in our lives and we worship him and we honor him and we love him and we live for him, that's when we experience life to its fullest. Whenever we put ourselves in the center of the story, we, we don't experience the life that we can have. It's, a, it's, it's his story and he's invited us to be a part of it and he's made it possible for us to, to be reconciled to him because of what he's done for us on the cross. But this is his story and a big part of that is living for him and when we're living for him we, we have his heart which is reaching out into the world around us where we find life. And so the, the big questions then, well, well, why do bad things happen? Sin entered the world. Our fault, not God's. How, how does a God who claims to be good allow so much mess in the world? The ability he gave us to make choices can't be suspended. And we've made lots of bad choices and there's been consequences and continues to be. Well, why doesn't he do something about it? He has. He went to the cross. He's already done everything that needed to happen. And, and we live in that understanding. And until we have some breakthroughs in, in that thought process and start thinking and seeing more like he does, it really is hard for us to, to live in a way where that light shines through us. But when we begin to see that, things happen. Amazing things happen. See, how does the light of the world see things? Point four. Same story, John 9, 3 through 5. Jesus says this, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. See, Jesus, the light of the world, he sees the man born blind, and what does he do? He's not judging him, trying to figure out, making it. He just loves him, and he ministers to him. See, the light of life sees people in need and loves them and reaches out to him in some fashion in some way. It's what he calls us to live like. You know, in, in, that, in that verse, this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. And that's a powerful thing. So, so you know, so I liked what Dr. Clem said earlier today. He said, when things happen, don't get so busy asking why. Just say, God, what, what can I learn in this? You know, I, when a hurricane comes and totally upends your world, you could get really messed up, or you could just say, God, what do we do now? Which is what we said. And, and so many things happened that, that touched and changed people's lives, that changed our lives. I was, I was talking to Pastor Dave and Clem earlier. You know, I, I, I don't want to go through another one. <laughs> but I wouldn't exchange what happened for anything just because of how God made himself so real, and I loved him before, hear me, but, but he was so real and so faithful. Things would happen that, that I, 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 I take out of the story that we would say things in the midst of that stuff. We would, we would voice a need that we have, and it would walk through the door within minutes. I, I shared a story with them. Six weeks into this whole thing, uh, I had a new project manager there who would come. I said, you know, those, they were coming down every other week or every week, and uh, he was just there. And all of the chainsaws that we had, every single one of them, had no, the chains were no longer any good. We were working our chainsaws really hard. They're dull. They weren't working. And he said, we need to get these chains sharpened. Who do we have that does that? He said, there was a guy here, but he's gone now. And I said... I, I don't think we have a guy that does that, and I don't know what we, what we used to do, but here's what we do now. And I grabbed his hands, and I said, let's pray. And, and the simple prayer, Lord, we need to have these chainsaws working because there's a lot going on, and so we need you to send us somebody to sharpen these chainsaws. In Jesus' name, amen. I let his hands go, and he was kind of looking at me like, really? I thought there'd be somebody I could call. 
<laughs> I said, listen, just wait. Come back and see me. I, I bet 30 minutes there's somebody here. 15 minutes later, he comes back. He said, I can't believe this. Like, I just walked in and said, I'm here to sharpen chainsaw blades. <laughs> Had the tools. Th those things just happen. You can't make that stuff happen. But, but see, it's all part of embracing the idea that, that all of this is God's. And, and it doesn't always go the way we want, but that's okay. It's like, God, how can you use this? And what will you do? And so this cause and effect thinking, we need to get away from it so that we can live for Jesus. See, the, the trap of cause and effect thinking, this is what it does in verse 5, and, and this is what the established religious community was in. Let me read this to you, John 9, 13 through 16. Here's the trap. So they brought to the Pharisees the man who had been born blind. Now, on the day on which Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore... The Pharisees also asked him how he'd received his sight. Well, he put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. And some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. Now look, these guys, if they knew this guy had been born blind. This wasn't a, and, and he's seeing. He's standing in front of them seeing. Don't you think that it at least make you go, Wow. <laughs> You know what they were upset about? Jesus made mud on the Sabbath. It was against the rules. You weren't allowed to work. Making mud was against the rules. Healing was too, but they, they were, it was the making mud that they were upset about. And so you go, yeah, he's not doing it the way we're supposed to do it, so uh, he's not from God. That can't be God. They missed God at work because he didn't fit into their box. Do you see how amazing and, and sad that is and why we have to be so careful? They missed the, the, the Holy One was there among them just wanting to reach out to them and they missed Him because of the way that He was doing and operating in the process. They were so stuck in their perspective. They couldn't see the light of the world. Standing in their midst because they're, they're the ones that are spiritually blind. If you, there's a lot going on in this story. How does the man born blind see it? And this is, this is the, the connection. I'm going to read a few verses. John 9, 10, and 11. How then were your eyes open, they demanded. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud, put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash, so I went and washed, and then I could see. Verse 17. Finally, they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened, and the man replied, he's a prophet. Verses 24 through 34. A second time they summoned the man who'd been blind. Give glory to God, they said. We know this man is a sinner. And he replied, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. <laughs> they were so frustrated. And they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered, I've told you already, and you don't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? And then they hurled insults at him and said, You're this fellow's disciple. We're disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as far as this fellow, we don't even know where he's come from. And the man answered, Now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners. He listens to the godly man who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. The, the man born blind is now teaching the religious leaders, right? <laughs> to this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. <laughs> not like they weren't steeped in sin at birth and still walking in. Get out of here because we got no other words for you. And so they toss him out. They toss him out. Well, look who finds him. I don't know if you've ever made this connection. Verse 35. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, do you love that Jesus is looking, seeing, loving? Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The Son of Man, it was a messianic title is what it really is. Do you believe in, in Messiah? Who is he? The man said, tell me so that I can believe in him. And Jesus said... You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. And then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. I want you to see the process of the man born blind. This is how the world gets impacted. Listen to where he started. 
Yeah, some guy named Jesus. You ever heard anybody talk like Jesus? About? Yeah, there's some Jesus guy. Yeah, he might be a prophet. Oh, he's, he's like a man of God. He is the Messiah. The connection happens to the one who was blind but now sees. See, see, that's what happens. That's what we need to understand. We must believe in Jesus all in, regardless of the situations and the circumstances of this life. Don't limit him with cause and effect thinking. And then let the light of the world shine through you to hope those around you to come and believe in the Son of Man, Jesus Messiah, so that together we can worship God, the one who is worthy of our worship now and forever. That's how it connects. That's, that's how we stand up and rise in a fallen world, on a broken planet, where, where things still happen that, that we don't care for. But God is the same. And God is the owner of it all. He's the Lord of all. And no matter what, we just come and, and, and we worship and we trust and we love and, and we honor him. And we live in the, in the mystery of the faith that, that's so good that we can't put him in a box because that would be such a boring life. But, but he gives us his life of adventure and opportunity to witness him at work and to, and to love him. And he, he invites us into his story where we're describing who he is and his light is shining through us. And people are drawn to him and they, they come to know him and believe in him so that they can worship him forever with us. See, that's the heart of God. And that's how he restores things. That's restoration. God using the brokenness in our lives, healing us to a place where we can go out and minister and help people in the brokenness of their lives so that they can come and be made whole by the healer of the universe, and the one who brings us back into life with him. I love at the end that, that it says he believed and he worshiped. So I think what we need to do is let's get the team up here one more time. If they're around. Are they in the room? We'll do a small team. I'm good. <laughs> there they come. If you've been coming... If you've been here for the, the morning sessions, they've been tremendous about worship. And, um, the reality of who we worship is life-changing when, when we recognize that, that He's the source and, and that we can absolutely trust Him with our lives. And that no matter the circumstance, he's God. And he's the God of love, and he's the God of life, and he's the God of relationship, and he's the God of forgiveness, and he's the God of grace, and he's the God of mercy. And that he loves us and wants us to join together in worship and to be a part of helping others come to know him. And, and with all that in mind, I would just ask, let's do this. Why don't you all stand right where you're at? And let's, with all that we got left at 8.20 at night, I don't know about you, but it's bedtime for me. <laughs> Sorry, it's just the way it is. With what we have left, let's give him all that we have left. And let's worship him all in who he is. Amen.